Tell, tell me about your your journey. I mean, you you teach at Harvard. What, what do you teach there? Uh, I teach history, and I teach a mix of things. Usually, in any given year, I'm teaching four classes. One will be a Jewish history lecture course of some kind, so either modern Jewish history or the history of the state of Israel. Um, and then I are teach. The, are those sorry. two? Are those two the same? Like, what is what is considered no, different modern? Courses. So, modern Jewish history is the whole world. You know, it's Middle Eastern mm -hmm. Jewry, European Jewry, American. It's everything okay. from the 1600s to the present. And then okay. I also do a lecture course on um, the rise of the Zionist movement in the state of Israel. So that's like from the 1870s, 80s to the present. Uh, and then I usually teach a seminar and it could be on all kinds of things, nationality theory, national movements. Um, I teach seminars on the history of emotions, which is a really interesting topic. Um, and um, it's a very mystical, I would say, topic. Well, it's actually very psychological. So it's kind of a mix of history and psychology. Yeah. And I mean, it's an interesting course. Yeah. The history of emotions. How do you even document emotions throughout history? Well, people feel the same way that they think. And documenting feeling is sort of like documenting thought in that people write stuff and you discern uh, feeling. And the fact is that there are emotional norms in societies. I mean, there are ways that you're just sort of allowed to feel and to manifest feeling. So, for example, um, a lot of people use teaching manuals or parenting manuals and how they change. And all you have to do is spend time in Israel compared with other countries, and you see how people are kind of encouraged to express certain emotions in Israel that you can't in, say, northeastern United States. Uh, you know, anger, for example, <laughs> is a much more open society towards the expression of anger. Yeah. Um, so anger is, a, or emotions in general, are just as much a component of human, really, um, the pillars of human uh, consciousness as thought um we spend just as much of our life being happy sad afraid you know proud whatever as we do in fact much more probably than we do thinking rationally about about a subject so yeah. emotions have histories and they can be traced and um so i teach seminars on that but i also teach courses on something very different i teach general courses to the freshmen and sophomores on um history of warfare Oh, wow. And uh, I teach a method seminar for the sophomores about military history as a discipline. And it all sounds like it's not connected, but it really is. It all has one thing in common, and that's Israel. Because Israel is a country where Jews have created a, a, a military. Um, and the military tradition in Israel and military thinking is very powerful. So that gets you into military history. But Jewish history is filled with pain and grief and uh, trauma. And that gets you to the history of emotions. And Israel is a young country, which gets you to the history of nationality. So in a way, everything I do is in some way or another related to Israel. It just doesn't seem that way at first. Yeah. But it all, it all has a common denominator. And especially when you think about, what, sorry, when, you, when the, the first thing, when I think about military, military history is not Israeli battles and wars you know you think of napoleon you think of i don't know world yeah. war ii world war one whatever you want certainly not the israeli wars and yet um, those wars have been uh so consequential i mean obviously for the jewish people but also for the palestinians for people throughout the arab and muslim world yeah and really the world as a whole you yeah know, it might be some relatively small battle in 1948 or um you know the 1967 war had battles right I mean, the, yeah conquest of the Sinai was a battle. Uh, every war that Israel has fought is in one form or another um, uh, related to the basic principles of military history. So I get students who are interested in everything from Hannibal to Napoleon to the Navy SEALs of the 21st century. You know, they, they write on whatever they want to write on. Yeah. They're just telling me where I'm coming from. Right. And right, kinds right. of things that interest me. I actually use Israel as one of the case studies in the class. So, so I'm actually very curious about also the kinds of students that attend your classes, like the classes on, on uh, Jewish, modern Jewish history and Israel. Is it only Jews? Is it mainly Jews? Is it a whole mix? What kind of kids do you get? Um, 
It's a funny thing. When I taught at the University of Toronto, where I spent quite a long time, it's a huge university. And, uh, you know, I'd get 60 students in a course on modern Jewish history or on Israel, and maybe a third maybe would be Jewish. The rest would be not Jewish. Really? Uh, yeah, because it's an interesting subject. You know, Israel's in the news. People are interested, so they take the course. And um, I also teach seminars on uh, Jewish identity. I think I teach a course called Power and Identity in Jewish History. And uh, that course has attracted, again, when I was in Toronto, students from all over the world. You know, uh, they're just interested. Jews are in some ways kind of a model minority. Uh, so in Canada, where I taught in, in Toronto, it's a very multicultural city. You have Chinese Canadians, Korean Canadians. And they're all, they're, they're interested in Jews. You know, Jews are an example of a minority group that, again, is very visible. Um, they've heard a lot about Jews. Sometimes they went to school with Jews. Harvard's a little different in that I'd say about two thirds of the students are Jewish in one form or another. That mm -hmm. is, they may be from observant homes. They may have one Jewish parent, one non-Jewish parent. They may have had a Jewish upbringing. They may not have had a Jewish upbringing, but they identify in one way or another as Jewish. And then the other third are everything under the sun. And my guess is that my uh, course next year that I'll be teaching on Israel, uh, um, it's called One Land, Two Peoples. Uh, Israel, Palestine in the 20th century, my guess is that course will get a lot of non-Jewish people who are just interested in the subject. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, you're too young to remember this, but there was a commercial or a series of ads in magazines and newspapers way back in the day for a rye what's bread. A newspaper? Now, what's a newspaper, right? <laughs> Called Levy's. And the ad was, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's rye bread. And they'd have a picture of, say, a, a black American or a Native American or something. And today, I guess it would be considered um, racist or whatever. But back then, it was just considered humorous. Right. You have pictures of people from all these different ethnic or racial communities. And the one thing they yeah. all have in common is they love Levy's rye bread, which is, of course, true. I mean, everybody eats bagels. Um, so you don't have to be Jewish to love Jewish history or Jewish studies. Um, often the best students are non-Jewish because really? they take the course out of curiosity. They're just interested. Um, whereas a Jewish student might take the course thinking, oh, I know this stuff. You know, I went to Hebrew school. Mm. I had a bar mitzvah. I know this stuff. So do you actually, do your, do your non-Jewish, do they challenge your thinking more than the Jewish ones do? It's just coming out from a completely fresh perspective. Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't say that. I think they all challenge me. One thing I like about Harvard is that um, once you win the student's trust, because uh, they're always afraid of getting their professor angry because they don't want to get any grade lower than an A. But once, once you win their trust, they do challenge you. I mean, when I was teaching my modern Jewish history course in the fall, I didn't go five minutes in lecture without students asking questions and pushing on a really interesting point and disagreeing politely. And um, that was a great class. They were, they were marvelous students. So, um, yeah, yeah, they push, but I don't think it's like the non-Jewish students push more than the Jewish ones. They, they can all do it. No, for sure. Um, I guess my question there was like, we don't know our own blind spots, mm -hmm. obviously, right? They, they wouldn't be blind spots if, if we knew it, that they existed. And when you're so steeped in your own culture and history and the stories that we all get told from our, our parents, our friends, our schools, our communities, right. it's hard not to see like the, the weird neurotic things and ticks that we have that, you know, as you said, get passed down over many, 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 many generations, right? For the good and the bad. Yeah, obviously. I think the Jewish culture is wonderful and I'm, I'm very grateful to be a member of it. And it has just tremendous amounts of benefits. And I mean, just also living in this country, um, I know that in, in the popular understanding, people, they, they view this country as, I don't know, some war machine or some uh, occupying country. But, you know, when I walk around the street, I don't see people, uh, you know, thirsty for blood or trying to place Arabs in prisons, right? Um, I see a lot of wonderful people doing wonderful things. I also see a lot of normal people doing things as well. But it's a wonderful country, and it's given it's, – it's a flourishing country. And I do think that that's in some way a 
manifestation of a Jewish spirit, such as it is, right? I mean, that's that's its own own conversation, but there is some force, some spirit that has been alive in a certain group of people for many thousands of years now and it's awesome and it's and it's alive and it's kicking and it's it's its own force and here we are yeah and you're, yeah. And you're teaching it <laughs> yeah i am and trying to communicate exactly what you were saying uh trying to communicate to students some of whom have never been to israel uh some of whom really don't know much about it some of whom have yeah. had some connection like maybe they went on birthright but that's about it yeah uh trying to communicate that energy that is I think uniquely Israeli and the fact that it took an awful lot of energy to create the state and to maintain it. This is not a state that just emerged kind of of itself. Yeah. And it's always been controversial You know, everything from 1947 when the United Nations was debating what to do with Palestine to the present. It's yeah. always controversial. People have always been both in love with the country and furious with it and, uh, you know, steeped in, in hatred of the country. You've always had both. And, um, you know, now just in the last few months, of course, uh, Israel is now more visible than ever and more controversial than ever. And what we've been going through at universities throughout North America has been just, uh, you know, an explosion of attention paid to Israel, anger and frustration. Talk about the history of emotions. Hmm. And then Jewish students who, frankly, are all over the map in their reactions. You know, there are Jewish students at Harvard who are very attached to Israel. And they're very angry and frightened by what's been going on, by the pro-Palestinian demonstrations and the things people are saying and doing. There's another big clump of Jewish students who are, they have some feelings about Israel, but they also have uh, qualms and concerns about the country. And they're kind of on the fence. And then you have a minority, but they're pretty vocal of Jewish students who are very much in the pro-Palestinian camp. And mm -hmm. this is not exceptional to Harvard. This is now pretty common at any of the major sure. uh, American universities. So we can't say it's like Jews versus everybody else. There's actually a lot of dissent within the Jewish community. And we're that's Jews. Some, <laughs> we're Jews, right. And that's something that nobody knows how to handle. It's in that Jews who are attached to Israel feel you know, very threatened by the Jews who are pro-Palestinian and who call themselves mm. anti-Zionist. And they can be quite mean to each other. You know, the groups can be really quite hostile to each other. And I just worry about the rabbinic saying that the second temple was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. And I, I do, I worry really more about difference within the Jewish community than I worry about tensions between non-Jews and Jews. I think as long as the Jewish community stays strong, um, and if not united, then at least sympathetic to each other, and caring for each other, then we can, I think we can get through pretty much anything. So, uh, but, but that's not the case right now. So this has been a pet peeve of mine ever since, not this war, but the, the war before that. So I'll just, I'll just tell you a brief story, but that was something that happened to me. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was working at Bloomberg News um, and I was covering the war in 2021. I don't know if you remember this war. Um, yeah, May of 2021. Exactly. It was 11 days. It was, it was terrible because I was just around the clock consuming uh, just terrible news and watching because there, there were also basically riots happening inside the country in all the mixed cities. Right. And so I was uh, consuming all this information, but also watching um, places in my society very close by descending into anarchy like they had to send in the police they had to send in, i think even parts of the army to quell these these riots and all this all this violence and um i'll never forget it so the 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 uh, so hamas sent uh launch rockets into tel aviv and that's where i was living at the time and my son i had two sons at the time my wife was pregnant with the third and my eldest son he had just turned five and they were both asleep. It was nine o'clock at night. We had just finished dinner with some friends. And um, the rockets, uh, yeah, sorry, we, we hear the sirens. Okay, we grab our kids. We don't have a, we didn't have a safe room inside the house. So we had to go downstairs. And uh, they were still asleep. We went down, you know, we hear the booms from the Iron Dome. 
And, uh, and then I, I start to go back upstairs because I was like, oh, Christ, I have to work. I have to send these headlines. I got to start writing a story. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Anyway, Hamas wasn't done. They, they had done this several times. I think they had launched something like 100 rockets that night. Up and down, up and down we go. And my son, he was five, and he was just beginning to become aware of his surroundings and, and aware of his body. And he was almost naked. He was in his underwear. And so imagine you're five years old. You know, you're, you're sort of, you're kind of coming into yourself. You're half naked. There's some strangers around you. And some cold, like, what's, why am I taking out of bed? And he hears these, you know, loud noises and all that kind of stuff. And and the last, the final time that we go, we go up, he and I, he says, uh, Abba, t- take me to the bathroom, I need to pee. And he vomits. He just pukes. And he's crying. And I said, uh, I want to go to sleep, right? And uh, anyway, so that evening, you know, passes with, you know, some more stress from the wife. Oh, my God, what the hell are we doing here? All that kind of stuff. And uh, the next day, my son... Uh, of course, this was coming. He asks me, so Abba, what, what were all those wee wheels and the booms? That's how he called it then. And so I sat him down and, uh, and I have a rule. I don't, I don't lie to my kids. So I sat him down and I said, um, and just, I started this verbal diarrhea of like, look, <laughs> this thing called Jews and there's this and they have Palestinians, they've got Iron Dome and that, you know, cause I'm thinking, how do I help? How do I explain this to a five-year-old child? Right. And it was just this confused mess of, you know, borders and, co- and conflict and people are good and people are not, sometimes they're angry and you know, it just didn't make any sense. And he, you know, as kids do, he just sliced right through all the bullshit. And he said, Abba, do these people want me dead? Five years old, right? And so I had like one stab to the heart and I said, yes. And, um, and then he said, do you know why I threw up yesterday? And he said, no, tell me. He says, because I was scared. And, um, and it just, it, it felt, it, for the first time in my life, that moment, I felt like all of, like the weight of all of my life's decisions being represented in this innocent five-year-old boy. Like I was instantaneously mourning his innocence, right? He was now a part of this insanity where strangers are launching rockets from Gaza perhaps killing me or my son. I mean, obviously nothing happened, but that is the intent. Strangers, I don't know these people. They don't know me. They don't know my son. What does my son have anything to do with it, right? Or I don't have anything to do with their kids. And, and it's like, oh my God. But, but I also, not only that, I mean, I, I grew up in America and I came here and it's like, well, what the hell am I doing here? Why, why, why am I pushing my kids, my wife and all that kind of stuff into this place? And there's only one answer. And this is the answer. This question has been tormenting me ever since. Is that it's because I'm Jewish, right? And and that's the only reason this place exists. And I realized that I didn't have a good answer for what that actually meant, um, because we get taught the rituals and the history and the stories and the songs and all that's lovely, but no one can actually tell you what it means. What well, so what is it? What is a Jew, right? And so to tie this back to what you're saying about this division and uh, this level of animosity that you're seeing even be- between young Jewish people, it strikes me as a symptom of mass confusion, right? Where everyone's arguing, but they don't even know what they're arguing about, right? Ostensibly, it's about this war, right? Or the treatment of Palestinian people and their suffering. But if you just peel back one more layer, it is a, what is the point of this country? Should it exist? And is it worth the trouble if it should exist, right? These are all the same questions just asked in different ways. And um, I, I, wish, I wish that there was, there's a, a better and more fundamental conversation going on regarding that. And anyway, so I spoke a lot, but <laughs> you tell Lois, me what you think. Uh, oh, my God, your story. It's um, my grandchildren are the age of your kids. And um, they're six and then twin four-year-olds and a six-month-old. And the six-year-old is just at that point you were describing. Now, they live in Canada where, you know, nothing happens. So it's not like there was a traumatic experience like you were describing with your son. But I realized last time I was visiting the kids for Pesach that the six-year-old is becoming aware of the world and making that, that, that crossing that border, maybe not quite as traumatically as your son has but still 
um, you know, if young people are willing to take the time, they can learn a lot. And I think they would find in learning something much more than an academic enterprise. I have to yeah. make some remarks about this today in the history department where our, our seniors are, are here with their parents and they're graduating and they're celebrating. And something I really believe is that studying history of any kind, doesn't matter who you are and what you are, uh, it anchors you. It gives you a sense, I'm not alone. Other people have been here before me. Other people have dealt with these problems because right now the world is full of problems. Um, in Israel, the problems are particularly grave, but not a great time on the planet. And um, history teaches you, we've been here before. You get a sense of what is and is not possible. Um, I think it's psychologically very healing. And the same thing for Jews. Uh, the The problem is is that people have very different ideas of what it means to be Jewish, and they can be quite intolerant if people have other ideas. So, for example, for a certain kind of very idealistic, anti-Zionist Jewish person, they believe that to be Jewish is to have universal moral values. And the universal moral values include, uh, uh, you know, healing the sick and clothing, the, uh, feeding the poor, and, and certainly not making war against people. And so for them, it's very simple. Israel, in their view, is making war against uh, innocent people. And, you know, they acknowledge there are some bad actors, but there's a lot of innocent people. This is not something Jews should not do because Jews have an obligation. And that's an old idea. I mean, have they read the, the Bible, though? <laughs> well, that's the problem is, see, the Bible is full of violence and it's also full of particularism. It's full of morality, but it's also sure. full of bad stuff, too. Um, and they were raised with a certain kind of highly universalistic set of values from well-meaning parents, you know, good parents. Mm -hmm. And ever since the 1800s, the Reformed Jewish tradition has very much emphasized universality. What makes us special in that view is that we're so universal. And that's one set of values. Mm -hmm. And then there are students, I'd say, who have maybe stronger upbringings um, or different upbringings for whom being Jewish is more particular. And then there are the really bright students and the ones I like the most who are somehow com trying to combine both. Mm. You know, you have the students who are from what I call FFB, from, from birth. Uh, so, you know, modern Orthodox kids or pretty observant, conservative, whatever. They know a lot. They went to Jewish day school. They've been around the block. Um, but they also have pretty dovish politics. And they know that it's contradictory and they know that it's hard yeah. and they struggle. And the problem for them is not only are they maybe going to get hassled by Jewish kids on either side of the political spectrum, but then they're going to be uh, shunned when they get into progressive political spaces at Harvard and they want to get involved in a political society that, can't, uh, uh, that fights against racism or it fights for women's rights or, you know. Yeah. And then people say, well, we don't want you because you have not and you're not willing to denounce Israel. That's a problem that goes back many years. I was a visitor here in 2006 and ran into that. This is a problem, and it's not only Harvard. It's all over that, you know, if you want to be a progressive, there's a whole box of whatever. There's a whole list. Yeah. You no know, vegetarian, or you don't drive a car, and you wear renewable clothing, and, you know, and you denounce Israel. And this is something that these students just don't want to do because Israel matters to them. And, you know, full, full uh, confession on my part, I like these students a lot because they're mm -hmm. struggling. They care about Israel. They care about being Jewish. They care about the world. They're getting a lot of grief for it. And these are wonderful students. Uh, but they don't, have, they don't have the tools to fight back, it sounds like. So they have these, these cultish people saying, we're, 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 tick the boxes. Where is your renewable yeah. car and your hatred for Israel? <laughs> yeah, well, they, 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 they develop those tools. Uh, mm. I mean, they complain to me, and that's their, my job is to listen. Because, mm. uh, uh, you know, I'm not only a professor here, I'm also the director of the Jewish Studies Center, and I talk right. to a lot of Jewish kids. I listen. Uh, I'm not a rabbi. You know, it's not my job to give them spiritual advice for that. They can go to Hillel across the street, which is fantastic. Harvard Hillel is a wonderful, wonderful place. No, I have a different job, but I do listen. And uh, I encourage them to make choices they can live with. That is, if they have a conscience, and if Israel matters to them, then they're going to have to live by that. And it might mean that they have fewer friends. 
in some of those progressive circles, or it might mean that a certain club won't take them and they'll have to go somewhere else. I mean, that's, as I tell them, it's tough to be Jewish. And there was a period of time, maybe between the 1960s and the early 2000s, when it was really easy to be Jewish in the United States. But my parents' generation, my parents are children of the Great Depression. Not only were they poor, they dealt with levels of anti-Semitism that today um, would just be considered totally unacceptable. You really? Know, well, think about it. The U.S. in the 1930s, jobs you couldn't have. If you were Jewish, there's this whole lines of work you just couldn't do. No way. Mm -hmm. Universities you couldn't go to. Professional schools you couldn't go to. Places you couldn't live. And it was just out there in the open. No dogs or Jews allowed on this beach, that kind of thing. I live in Canada for the last 25, 30 years. We have beaches on Lake Ontario. There were signs in the 1920s and 30s, no Jews or dogs. Wow. So that's the kind of anti-Semitism that Americans experienced until after World War II. And then it began to decline. But still, I mean, the Ivy League schools only really opened up to Jews you know, maybe the late 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, and then slowly things opened up like Jewish doctors. You couldn't get a position in a good hospital if you were a Jewish doctor until the 1950s. Uh, you'd have to be a sole practitioner or you'd be in a Jewish hospital, right? Hmm. And that was just accepted. I mean, the people didn't like it, but, but that's the way it was. And then things really loosened up. And I grew up in a world where I had no limitations. I went to Stanford, which um, was not the most Jewy university in the world, but I, you know, went there and went to a good grad school and I just sailed through one thing after another. And being Jewish has never hurt me. You said, I, is, I, was lucky. Isn't, I was lucky. Isn't it interesting that it, it dovetails almost exactly with the creation of the state of Israel? You said in the 50s, this was around and then yeah. you grew up and exactly. it you didn't know opened up. Was. And also, it was a time when Israel was very popular in the U.S. You yeah. know, it's not just Jews who fell in love with Israel after the 1967 war. America in general, people, people liked Israel. I mean, Israel is, if, if, you, if you just open your eyes a little bit or sort of just shift your mindset just a little bit, it is the craziest American success story. <laughs> you, you know? It's like these down and out people who are just all over the world and they have this one guy has this crazy idea so it's like you know what let's all let's all get back together where it all started right. and we're going to make one of the best countries in the world you know several decades later it's like well, the best yeah. rags to riches you know this 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 is this movie's on yeah. lifetime and on netflix and whatever yeah, you want Schmattes, from schmatas <laughs> to riches yeah exactly it's a, a success story uh and as I tell my students, though, that was a historical blip, this period from the mid-20th century until the early 21st century. And then things began to get difficult for Jews again, mm -hmm. uh, partly because, you know, the United States is this great rags to riches country, but it's a country built on tremendous oppression. I mean, it was a country with slavery actually built into its founding constitutional document. And the legacy of slavery in the States, you know, it really it lives on to this day. And in the early 21st century, there's more and more anger and um, uh, frustration coming from black Americans who feel that the civil rights movement only got them so far, but there's still way more to go. Uh, so you have then um, the Black Lives Matter movement and a whole kind of movement on the American left that wants to make us acknowledge that the United States has hardly been the land of plenty for everybody. Just so many groups that have been excluded. And uh, Jews encountered resentment precisely because they've been so successful and because they've been identified because of the color of most of the Jews color their skin. Uh, they're identified as white and they're associated with white privilege and white success and, and white, uh, the term uh, supremacy and so forth. And of course, Jews have actually had a much more checkered past. And a lot of Jewish students, even if they're from privileged families, will say, yeah, but my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. You know, we, they, they've inherited a legacy of trauma, right. which right. the um, young leftists don't acknowledge. But it's gotten harder for Jews. It's, it's much harder to be a Jew in the United States. It's harder to be a Jew everywhere now than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, and that's the tough thing to understand is that it's, it's always been tough to be a Jew. 
And we just happened to have a period of a few decades where it was easy. Uh, and it's getting hard again. So one of the things that I love, and, and I, I actually do want to pick your brain about more, like what's actually happening on campus, because as I said to you before, I, I have no idea what to believe anymore when I see media stuff. But one of the things that I love about Judaism is that there is no victim mentality when it comes to Jewish history. It's like the Jews make mistakes. They get smacked upside the head by history and fate. And they say, well, I guess it was our fault. And let's pick ourselves up and we'll try again. And, you know, we just we keep trying. Right. And we're grateful that we're we've been given this life. Right. I think that's the first thing you do when you wake up is you thank God for for, for the fact that you're alive, which is precisely the right attitude that it takes to succeed in life. <laughs> it's like right. be grateful right. for all the things that you've got and take personal responsibility. You know, it, it, it just it's universally applicable. Right. And and. I, thankfully, I didn't have to figure that out for myself. Uh, many, 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 many people figured it out for me. And I'm the beneficiary of that wisdom, right? That knowledge. That's my privilege, if you want to call it that. But I still have to do it uh, justice, right? So uh, everyone does. Every human does. And so, but it's just, again, it's just my good fortune, that, uh, or every Jew's good fortune, that they are born into this tradition. And what a waste not to appreciate it and to take that and and run with it and of course to what you said right that the, the successful as jews you know that that uh, across many many societies are disproportionately uh successful relative to their numbers it 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 comes with the territory that that brings envy and jealousy and resentment and then that's just one step away from you know having murderous thoughts and you know just any kind of uh vengeful hatred uh, directed at your way so you start and you start brooding on that and then you get to the wildest fantasies that you can think of so yeah. you know it's what's interesting also is that i'm talking to you as this historian of emotion and and psychology as you put it it's it's so i mean it's, it's essential to all of human history but it's so interesting with in the jewish context where it's like you've got this branching off of Judaism and Christianity. And then it's this very annoying and persistent disease of the human soul, which is anti-Semitism that just keeps on perpetuating itself wherever Jews end up being. Um, so, but I, I, I do want to ask you because you're there and you're, you know, there was so much written about uh, the stuff in the Ivy League schools you know bill ackman got famously involved with um you know i mean i think there were like big jewish donors and stuff that were pissed off at how the administration was dealing with all this stuff what what actually happened i mean was it just sort of a couple of people making a lot of noise and then just the media seizing on that or was it actually really tense and uh um what was it like it's interesting it's sort of like what well, what caused the origins of the first world war was it just, you know, Gabriel Princip shooting the Archduke. Yeah. Um, okay. Look, the tragedy, the catastrophe of October 7th happened. Yeah. And almost immediately thereafter, a coalition of left wing student groups at Harvard, I think they say 34 student groups, but I think most of them have very small memberships and a lot of them didn't even know what was being done. So I would say, I would guess a core community of a couple hundred students out of 22,000 students at Harvard, issued a statement that said, um, whatever's going on is Israel's fault. And it's because they oppressed the Palestinians. That's what the statement said. And a few, maybe a day or two later, maybe the next day, they issued a clarification. We really feel bad about the people in Israel who were killed, but it all happened because of the occupation. And if they, they should, you know, we need Palestinian liberation. And that was the statement. Now, compared to a lot of what's been happening in the last seven months, that was actually kind of mild in that it was the statement and they didn't call for violence. They didn't, it was just the statement. But a lot of the um, Jewish students and Jewish alumni who follow events at Harvard very closely, I mean, it's amazing how, how closely Jewish alumni uh, are to Harvard. Uh, you know, they became aware of these statements and they got very, very angry. Uh, I mean, after all, the disaster had just happened. And uh, it's very, it's very of, wrong. 
This kind of reminds me of uh, an episode of Seinfeld where George Costanza is um, dating a woman who he suspects of being bulimic. And, um, and Elaine is saying something like, uh, like, are you upset about this? It's like, because she, he suspects that she's, he's, she's throwing up after every meal. And he says, yeah, of course I'm upset. I'm paying for these meals. It just, it kind of. <laughs> oh, that is so thick. It's funny. <laughs> So are, are they mad because their money is going to this, or are they mad because you know? This, I think they feel action. hurt and, and frightened. I mean, <laughs> they they're they're mourning and they're grieving, uh, and someone is saying, "Oh, it's all your fault." You no, know, it's very hurtful. Yeah. So I think what the students did was very hurtful. It was offensive and so forth. Um, however, um, the reactions were very strong, and there was a lot of pressure on the president of Harvard to issue some kind of condemnation of Hamas. And she issued a statement not long after, which was essentially, we feel sorry for the people who've been killed and, you know, we want there to be peace. It was kind of vague, kind of parva, as you'd say. Yeah. Uh, and then there was just Why? more and more pressure on her in the coming days to issue more, I would say, um, clear denunciations of Hamas. And the pressure was really quite fierce. And a former president of Harvard named Larry Summers actually publicly berated her. Hmm. And the pressure just got worse and worse. And we've now learned that um, she had quickly convened a committee of um, both public figures and scholars to look into anti-Semitism at Harvard. And they told her that they would quit if she did not quite specifically condemn Hamas. So then she made a video where she said that it's inappropriate to say from the river to the sea, that particular phrase, um, which a lot of Jewish students here and elsewhere find, you know, deeply frightening. Um, so the president was increasingly under pressure to say things condemning Hamas. The um, Chabad rabbi here and the students who were involved in Harvard Hillel. I mean, a lot of Jewish students were really, really frightened. Uh, and there were pro-Palestinian statements that, frankly, in the days after October 7th, became more fierce and more strident and more offensive. And then came the real problem. Now we're talking, you know, a few days after October 7th, um, uh, social media posts that are just vicious. You know, what young people do, what anybody can do with social media these days, they just say the most horrible things. And so Jewish students were waking up in the morning and opening their phones and finding really offensive social media posts, uh, uh, visual representations, as well as texts that were uh, extremely hostile to Israel and just downright viciously anti-Semitic hmm. on something called side chat, which is a social media platform available to university students and at least the way it was at harvard back then anybody with a harvard email address could use it and it's anonymous mm. you know brilliant That's right give a bunch of angry young people a chance to vent anonymously and all this did was add to the feelings of fear and frustration mm. and anger but real I mean, real fear on the part of many jewish students and not at harvard but at other universities the pro-palestinian students just got they got even more strident than here. I think it was at Tufts, I'm not sure, but where the pro-Palestinian students issued a statement, you know, celebrating the Hamas fighters for their, for gliding over the fence. And, you know, they sort of celebrated them as warriors. And um, was it at George Washington University where the pro-Palestinian students projected onto a wall to the glory of our martyrs, this sort of yeah. thing. So this really frightened students at any one particular place in America, but because of social media, anything that happens in one place happens everywhere. So what was going on at Harvard was frightening students here. What was happening everywhere else was informing everywhere else. And I think students at Harvard, you know, by the time we get to a couple of weeks past October 7th, are, are not only grieving what's happening in Israel, but they are really, many of them are really frightened. Um, so, that's what was going on. And the Claudine, Claudine Gay herself was under a lot of uh, pressure for not having done enough, allegedly, to combat anti-Semitism at Harvard. What, is, what were the considerations that she had that 
what were the political considerations that you had to not be, you know, say October 7th was terrible, you know, period. What, what, what was so well, hard she about did. that? She did say that. I mean, right. Her very mm -hmm. first statement was that how horrible it was. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to figure this out because as a historian, I like to wait 30 years before writing about anything, <laughs> but it just seems like there was a lot of suspicion of the president that because she is black and uh, works on issues involving race, uh, that she might be insensitive to Jewish students, that she might be more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. I just think there was, there was an underlying sense among, I think, many of the Jewish alumni and some of the Jewish students, but mm. not many, um, that there's a divide at Harvard between, let's say, minority students who have benefited from what's called DEI, uh, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion, it has a different acronym at Harvard, uh, and the interests of Jewish students. A lot of Jewish students had been feeling, I think, that as Harvard has been more and more attentive to homophobic or racist or transphobic comments, that their own concerns as Jewish students had been neglected. So there was a lot of perception of discrimination uh, or a favoritism. Uh, and then you've got a kind of steady drum of pro-Palestinian rhetoric coming in the days after October 7th, and then pro-Palestinian demonstrations, mm -hmm. which adds to the student fear. Um, you know, were the demonstrators harming Jews? Were they beating them up? Were they threatening to hurt them? No, but they were walking around and they were shouting things like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, or mm -hmm. globalize the Intifada, and these phrases were quite triggering for many Jewish students. So there was an atmosphere of mutual hostility, mutual fear. Then it turned out that Claudine Gay had, at least she, it appears that she plagiarized um, uh, parts of her uh, the, uh, work. She had to resign. You know, Harvard went into this kind of chaos mode. Uh, and underneath it all, you know, later in October, Israel launched its attack on Gaza. And remember that when Israel was first attacked, Israel had a lot of sympathy in the world. And there were outpourings of sympathy from Germany, where they projected a Star of David flag, the Israeli flag, mm -hmm. onto Brandon Brigade in Paris and London and Washington and so forth. And then Israel attacked Gaza. And as I knew was going to be the case, that public sympathy vanished. And more and more students at Harvard began to identify with the Palestinian cause as the death toll. Uh, mounted and as more and more Palestinians were killed. And so that kind of led us into November, December, a lot of pro-Palestinian demonstrations, and then um, very disturbing things like uh, uh, the posters of the hostages taken by Hamas. There's uh, posters all over Harvard Yard, which then uh, some people defaced in really obscene ways. Mm. and. Um, in some incidents like involving an anti-Semitic employee of the university who was acting extremely erratically and saying and doing really weird and, and dangerous, apparently dangerous things. So, you know, was anybody getting hurt? No, but there was an atmosphere, a very, I would say, frightened, nervous, unsettled atmosphere. Uh, there was one case of physical assault or alleged physical assault where a student, an Israeli student in the business school, claimed that he was uh, pushed by a couple of um, pro-Palestinian students. And th those students have just been um, charged, formally charged with misdemeanor assault. It's not oh. like he was hurt, but they evidently they, they gave him a patch, uh, push. So, but the real issue was an atmosphere of fear, anger, frustration, even panic among some students. So that's why the president put together a task force to investigate this and put two people in charge, me and a woman named Rafaela Sudan from the business school. And we were just about to get down to work. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, she was worried that the task force wouldn't be taken seriously by the president. So she chose to step down. Hmm. And then another, this is all public information. I'm not revealing any confidences. It's all in the Crimson, uh, the Harvard newspaper. And then another, another co-chair named Jared Elias, who was in the law school, uh, became, he, he's, he's now the co-chair with me and 
He's, he's great. And we've been working very hard. So we've just finished our uh, first round of work. We have talked to well over 500 students and faculty and staff at Harvard, most of them Jewish. Uh, we've had 40, uh, 40 listening sessions, each listening session of like an hour to two hours. Wow. We have, we have, it took two months. And, you know, in the evenings, we've just been going to session after session, letting people talk, tell us what they're going through. And we've been writing it down and thinking about it. So we've just finished that. We've written up some preliminary recommendations to the president about how we have to move forward and how things have to change. We'll continue our work in the summer, do more research, more work about how we got here because October 7th was a tragic event, but there had been issues and problems in terms of how people deal with different communities and different political beliefs at Harvard going back before October 7th. So we're going to come up with a major report in the fall for recommendations for change. What, uh, what I find, what I find, what I find so interesting about this is like, what the hell does a kid who's 18, 19, 20 going to Harvard, you know, I don't know, maybe they're, they have a future in some in industry in America. Yeah. Why, why do they get so riled up mm. about a conflict that's a day old or a few hours old? Um, I mean, as a Jew, I can kind of understand it, but you know, you don't see Jews, um, clamoring, you know, kill the, whatever, like some horribly genocidal statement like that, right. but to drive right. someone to say something like globalize the intifada when you're 18, 19, right. where, you, where you should be, one would hope full of hope and promise and potential. You've got your whole life ahead of you and yet you're filled with this rage at a stranger mm. maybe perhaps even at a place you've never been like what do you yeah. have any sense of why that is yeah i mean there's a few reasons one is uh first of all the kind of students who've been involved in the pro-palestinian activity range i mean there are the young ones who are 18 19 a lot of them are seniors so they're already in their early 20s yeah a lot are grad students so these mm. are people who are well into their 20s so that's number one number two a lot of them are students who are people of color that is, they are themselves of Middle Eastern origin, some mm. Palestinian, uh, Arab American, um, maybe Muslim students from South Asia, so from India or Pakistan. Okay. Um, and then black students. Uh, and then, the, and this gets to the issue of intersectionality, that for a lot of these students whose experience at Harvard, as, as in life, has sometimes been very difficult. You know, but they're at Harvard. They're at Harvard, and they're <laughs> grateful to be there, but they also feel a little out of place. Um, you know, there's a phrase in Yiddish to be via Yavona in a sukkah. It means to be like a Gentile in a sukkah. Uh, yeah, you get to Harvard, but they feel out of place. Uh, um, mm -hmm. It's a very intimidating place, Harvard. Um, and there are some students here who are from very wealthy families, and they've been living in luxury their whole lives, and they went to the right high schools, and, you know. Okay. okay. But... Um, there are, uh, so a lot of these students um, have rallied around, I would say, the cause of what they believe to be oppressed, dispossessed minorities in the United States. A lot of what's going on is not really about Gaza, although they say it's about Gaza. A lot of it is about the United States. It's about racism mm -hmm. in the U.S. It's about the Black Lives Matter movement. It's about the indigenous rights movement, it's about indigenous Americans whose cause was a big deal 50 years ago when I was young, and then it kind of went into abeyance, and now it's come back a little bit. So um, it's very much tied up with domestic crises. Um, so, and that's part of the students who are demonstrating for Palestine. And then the other part are, including the Jewish ones, are often white kids from fairly affluent backgrounds who, um, frankly, this is a really awful time to be young. The world is falling apart. Uh, there's global climate crisis. There's the United States is in a terrible political position, and they're looking for a cause. I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm trying to understand them without mm -hmm. approving them or disapproving them. They're looking for a cause that is clear cut in their mind and relatively manageable. Now, how do you deal with a problem of like human rights violations in China? What can you do? So 1.4 billion. I lose track how many people there are in China. It's big. Okay. What can you do? What can you do about Russia and Ukraine? 
you can do nothing. But Israel, even if I think a lot of these students are even, aren't even aware of it, it's pretty small. The Palestinian issue is, it seems fairly small. Gaza is small. It's like this, we can make this stop. The idea is we can, Israel is supported by the U.S., we can make it stop. And they can liberate the Palestinians and Palestine can be free and we'll have done something for the world. I, I, I'm not saying I approve this way of thinking. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just making clear because sometimes people don't understand me and then I get all kinds of grief. I'm just trying to understand their mentality. And these students are not necessarily stupid. Um, they care. They're frightened. They're worried about the world. And this is a cause that they feel is um, something they can engage with, identify with. Uh, and then they become part of a group and they have that feeling of belonging and uh, like the encampment that was here where for a couple of weeks students you know, were camping out in the Harvard Yard in tents and they felt a sense of community. I felt some of this back in the late 70s when my students, my students, when my uh, fellow students were all campaigning against South Africa and uh, apartheid and we were marching around and, you know, so once it starts, it, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, so you've got all these different factors coming together. It, it, it's not just what's happening in Gaza, although that's a necessary component. There's just so much else going on. Yeah. And it's giving it's, young people a cause. It's, it's, it's interesting. So uh, several things here. And again, th this isn't to judge one way or another because we were all young. And, you know, if you just look back at the choices we made, you're like, oh my God, right? But... Um, you know, the idea that the president of the United States is going to listen to some college kids who have no lobby, you know, who have no, they don't represent some massive interests. They don't have, you know, energy resources that they control or anything like that. I mean, that is, is zero um, motivation to listen to what these, in fact, and they don't vote. Right? Young people don't vote. Right. So, so this, this idea that the president would somehow take any of this stuff seriously doesn't make any sense at all. Um, again, not to knock on those kids. Like if they truly believe it, go go for it. Um, but I, I love I love the how you frame it as a as a personal quest. It's like they they're channeling their rage, the injustice that they feel in their own lives. Now, I, I again I wish that they had some wiser person to counsel them and say, look. Perhaps, but life is not fair and there are better ways to deal with it other than, you know, threaten some <laughs> random Jewish stranger that you, you may have to share a, a college class with. Um, yeah. How is that well, helping you, you know? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of um, variety among the pro-Palestinian students. Some of them are actually quite nice people and sure. would not assault or, I mean, there's a little bit would not want to offend or be really nasty to Jewish students. But there are others who are, you know, they're extreme. And there are, there have been a lot of cases at Harvard of Jewish students who are, you know, subject to nasty comments or social shunning has been a real, a real issue, a real problem. Hmm. Um, you know, again, you get 6,000 young people in a small space and a lot of weird stuff can happen. <laughs> uh, just it's hard to adolescent passion is sort of like it, we're talking megatons here yeah right yeah. there's a lot of force in that adolescent passion uh and real anger at the state of the world real fear about what's going to happen in this country in november and then the sight of thousands and scores of thousands of people being killed yes far away um and, you know, I asked myself, okay, this is a great tragedy. And I was talking to a scholar from Ethiopia, and I asked him how many people have died in the Ethiopian civil war in the last 20 years or so. And he said, I don't know, about a million. Wow. Well, the numbers are staggering. But, you know, it's not on the news every day, and the U.S. is not so publicly supportive of it. And... um to get back to where we started, Israel has always been highly visible. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was in the 70s, it was mainly positive. You know, people liked Israel. Even now, most Americans support Israel. You know, despite yeah. what's happening at Northwestern or Berkeley or UCLA, most Americans support Israel. 
Yeah. But um, Israel's always been the highest profile country in the world, partly because of where it is. You know, if the, if the Jewish people really had wanted to be left alone, they might not have wanted to establish a state in the Christian Holy Land and in a land that Muslims also have come to venerate and, you know, in Jerusalem of all places. Uh, they might have wanted to go to Tierra del Fuego, you know, just like get far away. Um, so it's always been visible, sometimes in a very positive way, now increasingly negative. But, you know, there's also 70 million evangelical Christians in the United States who love Israel. It's essential to their religious belief. Uh, it's a love that comes with an asterisk in that they need Israel as part of their vision of how Jesus is going to return and bring about the end of days, but they support Israel. So, yeah, there's a lot of anger against Israel right now, a lot of hatred. Uh, Israel has always aroused, to get back again to where we started, very strong emotions, sometimes love, now a lot of hatred. Uh, that's not going to change. The, the, the nature of the emotion will change over time. The intensity will change a little bit over time. But the very fact that it receives this kind of visibility and powerful emotion, that's not going to change ever. Do you, do you worry about what this does to the, for lack of the better word, uh, brand of a Harvard or any other Ivy League school? The only comfort I get is that we're all going down together. <laughs> You know, it's true. It's like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Brown, Penn, now Dartmouth, they've all had these problems. Yeah. All. Chicago, which I thought was not going to have them, University of Chicago, you know, they called in the cops, UCLA, Berkeley. All of these schools are dealing with these problems. This is a nationwide, even Europe, you know, global uh, issue. It's not going to go away. And if young people think, oh, you know, I'm scared. I'm not going to go to Harvard. Where are they going to go? Uh, it's, it's not going to be any better. And this gets back also to the notion that being Jewish does involve challenges. They can move to Israel. Well, as you know, you just told me your story about your family during 2021. Living in Israel is pretty tough. So we're facing a lot of tough choices. And if the students really want to avoid any anti-Semitism, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, Vanderbilt said that they would provide a kind of, you know, environment friendly to Jewish students. They've had demonstrations as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that really Jewish students have to develop um, something that Jews have always had to get back to your comment about the Jewish spirit. Resilience. Um, it's not easy being Jewish. And we, I, I really admire, by the way, on this, because we're going to have to finish up soon. Mm -hmm. The students who direct, um, the student directors of our Hillel uh, chapter here, they're amazing. They have no illusions about what's going on. They know that we're in a tough situation here at Harvard, but they're full of energy and courage and hope. And they've been contacting students, Jewish students who got into Harvard, and they've been saying, come here. Mm -hmm. Don't hide. Come. We have a wonderful Jewish community here. They have religious services. They have great social events. They're wonderful kids. Couldn't be better. Uh, and we will live proudly as Jews. Hmm. And I think that's going to be the same thing at Yale and at Princeton and at Columbia and Berkeley and all of these schools, that the Jews just have to be proud of who and what they are and put up with the crap. And, and I'm serious. And, and it doesn't mean turn the other cheek and run away. Mm -hmm. It means you, you put up with it to the extent that, yes, you struggle against it as, as you can, but you, you don't run away. And, um, yeah, you show some... Uh, you show, you show some omas lev, or what's the term? I guess there's a more vulgar term for it in Hebrew that I won't use. <laughs> show I, some um, I, want, I want to leave you with uh, some dark hope. It's okay. my specialty. <laughs> so um, uh, in the 80s, um, one of the um, major, I think it the major cement company in Israel. Oh, um, Nesha. Yes, exactly. And Yitzhak Rabin, who was, I think he was the defense minister at the time, mm -hmm. he would check every morning to see how many um, crates or tons of cement would pass through into the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. You think, like, why is the defense minister that interested in, in how cement? It doesn't make any sense. And someone asked him, 
and he said, I want to make sure that those numbers continue to go there because if they have, if, if the Palestinians have something to do, that means they have less time to do to make more trouble. So right. wh why do I bring that up? Those same uh, students in Ivy League schools will one day have mortgages and kids and house payments, but they'll right. have too much, too much shit to do to cause more trouble to Jews. So uh, that's my dark hope for you. <laughs> well, you know, we all grow up, yeah. um, or at least most of us grow up. And, uh, you know, my job is not to propagandize or to get these kids to completely change their views. My, you know, my view is, my goal is just to get them to understand that complexity is not a dirty word. Right. And that of all the complex places in the world, Israel, Palestine is right up there. You know, it's really complicated. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, Israel is a wonderful country and it's, it's full of energy, positive energy and great things. Uh, and yeah, Israel's doing some things right now that a lot of us in America and in the world aren't happy about, but that's not unique to Israel. You know, we live in a world full of difficult situations yeah. and uh, just to try to instill into them humanity, just compassion and humanity for the different actors, the different players uh, involved they might come out still sympathetic more one side than the other. But, you know, I've had Palestinian students in my classes who start to see Jews in a new light. I've had Jewish students who go the other way and so forth. It doesn't guarantee, uh, you know, peace in the Middle East. But uh, as I tell my students, it's a necessary, although insufficient precondition. That is, Taking my classes, learning about what's really going on in the Middle East, in and of itself, is not going to bring peace. Certainly not. But it's it's a nice start, uh, <laughs> and that's that's really all I can do. So, uh, and I just really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to me. I've actually got to head over to the history department to uh, congratulate the seniors uh, and their parents on their achievements. So, uh, Derek, thanks a, so much for your time. This is this was fun. I'm happy we finally know. connected. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Be well. Okay, bye-bye.